So let's get it started. Um, I know it was a long day, so thank you for still uh, being here. Uh, and I know that there were a lot of talks which already uh, spoke about parts of governance. Uh, so this talk will be uh, about the general scope of blockchain governance. Uh, and I want to draw a picture of the future as well. Uh, and which path we might uh, go uh, or which might help us uh, to do a successful blockchain governance. Uh, I will not present uh, content uh, which is already out there or partially only. Uh, I want to present you uh, new insights um, and I try to add value with that. Please understand that as a um, foundation for discussion, uh, not for uh, I'm the expert here, that's not the case. Nobody is pretty much the expert in that space right now. Uh, and we all need uh, to go in the direction where nobody else went before. So to do decentralized governance, nobody know really how this functions. This is a path we will uh, need to go together. So you never change things by fighting existing reality. To change something, build new models that make the existing models obsolete. I was thinking about reorganization of society since I was um, 20. Actually, in 2010 was the year where I really started to think about that. And in the last year, um, after hearing about uh, blockchain, uh, I quitted um, a career as a, a technical account manager uh, at Kaspersky, a very well paid one, uh, to come back to the passion um, uh, that I want to have an impact in the world with the work I do, uh, to combine, so to say, my heart and my brain. And uh, I did uh, some activities last year containing um, a requirements engineering workshop for a society operation system. So the question, how can we build a digital society which might have a global um, uh, coordination function? Um, and the result of that workshop uh, in Dresden in the Impact Hub uh, in May last year was that something like Ethereum, if it's scalable uh, and if it's secure, uh, can indeed be the platform and the foundation for building such a system. Uh, other attributes which are directly related to that, which pretty much mean the same, are immutability, censorship resistance and availability. Uh, on the other hand, after figuring that out in the summer last year, um, I thought about, okay, that's the technology side. But what do we need to do to co coordinate a huge amount of people um, uh, to work together? And there is something very, very human in there. So it's all about humans, actually. We are all humans, so we don't build systems for machine. Well, some systems are for machine, but mainly they are for restructuring the way how we do business or how we live. So there's a question after the minimal uh, shared consensus about the principles we want to follow to enable global coordination. So for that, we started a project called a Constitution for World Citizens. Actually, uh, it was a group of between like 15 and 20 people which were involved with that project at that stage. And the thing which we come up with was pretty much uh, that we cannot complete such a constitution from that angle, that it is impossible to try to force values on somebody else, that it is impossible to write a document in 2D, so to say, which contains those values. We came up with the uh, answer that we need to crowdsource the principles and that we need to develop governance functions which enable us to understand the values and to find agreement on those values. So just to point out some uh, principles we figured out for us as a team, um, it's responsibility. So we believe that it is very important that when we see problems in the world that we take responsibility for that and do not wait that others do that because then we might wait forever. There's a direct and fair aspect, so uh, if we go in system design, we look for systems where you have direct participation um, and where you are able to uh, participate in a fair manner. I mean, you don't need to take that for your platform if you disagree with these values. I just want to point out some values uh, we find very appealing, as well as building systems which are sustainable. So if you build new market, we need to find a way that these markets can exist for a long period of time and that those markets are able um, to be sustainable, so to have closed resource loops. But enough uh, about uh, that values. Humans are very, very difficult um, to put into boxes. So every one of us thinks different, and every one of us has a different horizon. 
actually, I think you, you all have a horizon which is uh, more, more open and more global thinking, but a lot of people, they live in a village and they hear the gossip and they're interested in that, not into global problems or platforms like blockchain. Spiral Dynamics is just a model which tries to modulate uh, uh, this, this different thinking models. What I want to show here is, if we design systems, we always need to think that from the user side or from the people which use those systems, there are very, very different incentives why they use those systems. For example, uh, who is here because he thinks or she thinks that crypto is a nice space to earn money? One person, more two, three? You know, it's, it's, it's true, it's a good incentive. I understand that. Who is here because you think you can change the world with crypto? So we have all different incentives, but we need to respect that not all of us have the same incentives to follow that trend of blockchain. And that we need to take that in consideration when we think about governance. When I speak about uh, governance in these uh, circumstances, I think uh, we all know what it means to be self-aware. I can reflect with myself. But we as a society come to a limit. The technological acceleration we perceive right now with AI and robotics and the blockchain space, it's just getting too much for a single person. So we have too much change to follow up all those trends. The world is changing faster than we can rebuild our thinking models about the world. So to just follow that logically, it means that we need to start to work more collectively to understand the world, how, it is, how, how the world functions. And this means that hierarchical decision functions start to fail because they are not able to grasp the complexity of the world anymore. And when you think about blockchain, I believe that this is an opportunity for us to create a collective mirror to self-perceive us collectively in those systems we create. So governance mechanisms to optimize cohesion and synchronicity, I wrote there. Uh, what I'm saying here is we should think about what do we want to optimize? What is the goal of the systems we are building? I think we should build systems which help us to understand the world and make wise decisions about the future. And this is true for every D app, which is fully decentralized. Take this for example. I'm glad we all agree. Oh, aha. I'm glad we all agree. It is the same thing which happens every day. We speak with somebody about something and this person understands it differently. So synchronicity or having the conversation or having exchange of information is crucial to find the same understanding and move in the same direction. So governance, just to uh, define the words here, without having the view on crypto, governance is to exercise continuously sovereign authority over something, and the distributed aspect is to divide several or many, to divide it between several or many. If you combine that, that comes down to like uh, network governance. I mean, we don't speak about BitTorrent here. We speak about dApps and platforms. So uh, it's about distributed governance. If we take governance in a very simple way in blockchain systems, we speak about uh, protocol governance or layer one governance. So this means that when we think about cryptocurrency, it's really about which rules do we implement into the uh, protocol and what are the incentives in the network, um, so the economics, uh, to run the network. We need to divide that further. When we speak about decentralization, it's not about the servers which are just split over the world. This is one aspect. That's the architectural decentralization. But we have also a logical decentralization. This, in this case, means if we have a protocol which is attackable through one attack and all nodes are, uh, 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 are impacted by that attack, we have a logic centralization. Some people might disagree, they say, okay, logic uh, uh, decentralization means if you cut the system in half, both systems can run. I would agree with Bit, uh, Bitcoin that's the case, but if we have a general pro uh, like protocol um, problem, uh, which is part sim uh, in the same way from the nodes, we still uh, have a big issue here. So, and then there is the political decentralization or centralization. So if we want to really run um, resilient systems, we need to find a way to politically decentralize those systems. And this is one of the major things we need to speak about because if you're controlling as a product team 
um, uh, the D app, and you can shut down the smart contract. It's not politically decentralized. This is a sketch with the try to uh, uh, make a schema out of the development of decentralization when we start an ICO and then we bring an, into the world a product. So in the beginning we have the idea. This means one person is very centralized. Then we form a team, it's still very centralized. We do an ICO. We involve more people, it becomes more decentralized in that sense because one person might be able to go out of the project and it might continue. Then we have test launch, mainnet launch, and with those launches and with those steps, we need to ensure that we enhance the decentralization of that system on each layer, on the political, on the logical layer, and on the um, architectural level. If we uh, grow the system further, we will face, if we go into markets, a strong competition from the old industries. So they will fight against that. And if at that point the system is not decentralized enough, you will have strong lobbyism and pressure on those people which can uh, crack down on those systems. So it's very important that we, in the end, come up with a system which is fully decentralized, which means that the architect teams um, demote themselves from their role as a central authority in that system uh, and become just a participant. And I think this is a very, very hard way to go. This is not easy because it has a lot to do with actually I feel responsible for the baby I created and now I need to step down. I think I like the picture from growing children and then you have the point that you need to accept that they are old enough to work on their own. And that's pretty true for, for crypto economic systems from my point of view. So Satoshi Nakamoto created a system in 2008 uh, which was mature enough to uh, uh, eliminate the political uh, centralization problem in the beginning. And later on, and we all know this, uh, this became a, a bigger problem again because uh, the miners were starting to collude uh, and influence the system much more. Um, so this is the question if we will see uh, more negative impacts regarding uh, Bitcoin or we see uh, uh, it proceed, we will see. But this is a danger which is true for all systems. When it comes down to Bitcoin, I mean the miners have the control, they have the ability to uh, implement new code. They are pretty much the decision makers here, um, what is running, uh, how the network is running. If you look at the incentive structure here, we need to understand that everyone has a different incentive there. So for example, uh, the miners, they have an incentive to maximize the block rewards and they have incentives to uh, maximize the fees paid per transaction. But this is a different incentive when it comes down to the developers and the users. The users want to have a more richer experience with the features. They want to use that and they want to maximize their holdings. And the developers, well actually, uh, they are pretty aligned with the users, but they want to uh, also um, be able to participate to develop the system further. Uh, and some of them want to play uh, a crucial role, so the core developer teams, uh, and want to influence the system. Um, when it comes to incentives which are not aligned, um, but contradictory, uh, contra contradictory sorry. Um, for example, the miners against the users, uh, then we need to look and watch out that the governance system uh, will create an equilibrium. This means that you balance out the different interests in the system. Uh, if you don't do that, the system will, uh, like a biological system, um, uh, go to one side and die. And uh, just to understand also the incentive structure, if you are able to find incentives which are all aligned between all interest groups, these are the things which create huge network effects. When it comes down to Bitcoin, it is the price, uh, increasing price. So all the holders profit from uh, increasing price of Bitcoin. And that's the strong thing which creates a network effect in Bitcoin. If we look at the governance structure, it's an offline governance structure. This means the miner uh, speak with each other and they have their discussions in their offices over Zoom or whatever. Uh, and they come to uh, um, directions they want to go. And then they say a specific date, and then we have a Bitcoin gold. Or another fork. Or we don't have a fork, but an improvement of the protocol. So what I'm saying here is uh, we have an offline governance structure, uh, which results in the picture we have today. On-chain governance and off-chain governance are pretty easy to uh, differentiate. Just think about off-chain governance, everything you do normally in communication. 
to find a, a, a group's consensus. So it can be a discussion in, in, re, in the real world, it can be a mailing list, it can be a Reddit, Reddit community, or a Twitter, a Twitter influencer. On the on-chain governance, we speak about this, those governance functions which are implemented in smart contracts uh, and are executed uh, to govern the protocol or the system. For example, uh, Flat uh, Samfi, he is uh, very uh, interesting to follow and to read about when you want to know more about blockchain governance from the technical perspective. He really goes into bits and bytes. Um, and he is a big influencer though. So for example, he makes, um, uh, for example, that voting online, if you think that AOS should be uh, um, cut out of Ethereum, he makes that for fun. He says he's a troll, I believe him. Um, but the point is this influences, this is offline governance. Okay, um, we have um, different incentives when it comes uh, down to do we want to change governance structures with Bitcoin or Ethereum? If we change them, for example, to on-chain governance, this would mean that users and um, uh, miners are actually not participating anymore in the discussion of what is going to happen uh, with the protocol. So this is the reason why uh, people like Vlad say, okay, that's not a good idea, and I fully agree here. Uh, we need to really think about what do we want to have online, what uh, off, off chain, and what do we want to have uh, on chain. Who knows what a DAO is? It was spoken a lot about today, so I will not go too much into the depths here. It's just pretty much uh, a structure which is on chain governance to enable um, a pretty much what, um, what a shareholder representation is. So multiple people come together, put money in a, in a bowl together, and then they decide uh, in a voting principle how this money is going to be spent. Uh, unfortunately, the DAO had created one of the first uh, big uh, splits in Ethereum. You all know that, but uh, the DAO model itself is not that. It's one of the very important governance models we see on chain, and we see the reward uh, DAIO and the DAICO and a lot of different other models around that. Uh, and I think they will fly, uh, but this will take time. Um, when it comes down to how the decision was made in Ethereum, uh, there was a voting, um, a coin-based voting. This means that your vote is weighted by the amount of ether you stake. Uh, and I just want to bring that in because that's the government's algorithms you see right now or functions which are used. And the problem with this is, if you look at it, that one voter had nearly 25% uh, of the influence. So what is this? Is this really the governance function we are looking for? If we go further, um, I was uh, happy to participate at the Ethereum um, conference in Paris in, uh, uh, from the 8th uh, of, of, to the 10th of March. And at that conference, um, it was uh, at, at this building, at that courtyard, uh, there was an off-chain governance meeting. And that off-chain governance meeting, um, which is uh, people which participated are seen here, uh, actually discussed the parity wallet hack and what is with the freezing funds there and what to do with the freezing funds. It was a very emotional, very engaging discussion. And I think it was very valuable because it was a lot of bandwidth between the participants. And in the end, we saw a lot of disappointment, we saw a lot of anger, we saw uh, also um, people which said we need to be truthful with the principles we have, like uh, immutability. Uh, and the end consequence is what happened on the 24th uh, of this month, which uh, is the result of their voting. So we had a voting finished again through the coin um, holders, uh, so a coin voting uh, with the parity funds. Uh, and the result looks like that. We had like 300 uh, people voting against, uh, for yes, so that the parity funds will be opened up uh, through a fork. Uh, 330 which voted no. And when you look at the percentages, you see uh, that there is a huge difference because of the influence, how much money you stake there or how much ether you stake there. The problem is with staking coins is that you can influence people by, uh, um, um, by paying them. So you, you just pay them uh, to en ensure that they vote for you. And this is happening actually. So people get rewards for, pay, uh, for voting in your favor uh, and this influences the results. So we have seen that in the past uh, with multiple examples 
uh, that this can be manipulated. And this results pretty much uh, in, in the risk that we uh, face a plutocracy. So as long as we have good leaders there, everything is fine. But what I'm saying here is that there is the risk um, uh, that the good kings might be pressured to make different decisions. And then we face as a community the situation that we cannot go through with the decisions anymore because we have very strong votes on the other side. I hope that this will not happen. Uh, the other side is we have an underrepresentation of all those interests which are not represented through the coin holders. This is the current state, and just to give you an overview, and I might miss all, you know, like a lot of things which are happening there. I'm, I'm pretty sure that, that I did not cover it, uh, even a fraction of it. But I want to speak with you about higher order distributed governance. So we spoke about like the simple steps we have right now, the simple principles we have right now, but the question is what can we do? And when it comes down to blockchain governance, I think the simple governance we see with layer one governance and the real world governance we see in our world, like when we think about politicians or about D apps, which have, depending on the D app, much more sophisticated governance models. Um, the question is, are they, are they different or are they the same? I think that they belong to each other. I think that they are depending on each other uh, and I will explain why. Um, I want to give you um, another um, definition, and this definition is, please don't take it too serious. Just take it for a thinking thought or to think about it. Uh, introduction, uh, de-governance is uh, introduce, introducing shared decision making without central authorities or hierarchies to legitimate a decision. The outcome needs to be balanced to optimize for the least negative and the most positive impact on all involved parties. In other words, uh, legitimate decisions while optimizing for omni-win while keeping equilibrium with asynchronous incentives or interests. This includes a principle, a principle which says let's try to not maximize for one party the outcome, but let's try to minimize the negative impacts uh, for all parties involved. This is very important if you have limited shared resources. Limited shared resources like this planet, for example, but also uh, if we want to uh, avoid conflicts, open conflicts um, or tensions, this is very important uh, to aim for omni-win instead of competition. If we look at Wikipedia and look on collective intelligence, we see this structure. And it struck me because if you look very um, deeply there, you have on the left side the cognition and then you have predictions of future events in politics and technology. What part of blockchain is fitting there? Any ideas? Prediction markets. Gnosis, for example. So prediction markets play a role when it comes down to um, uh, collective intelligence or to how we can make decisions together. If you look at cooperation, we see networks of trust, open source, and peer-to-peer -peer business. What is this? It's the blockchain. It contains all the elements. And if we look at coordination, we see ad hoc uh, communities and uh, coordinating collective actions. These are the governance functions. So let's move forward um, to connect a little bit more dots. Ignorance is the mother of all evils. I think that we all, that we are all are ignorant. And this is, don't, don't take it as offense. We just have all a very limited view of this world. And, um, if we accept that, this gives us the opportunity to ask questions and to understand more. Um, so I think that we are all not capable of really understanding the whole world. So uh, if we accept that, we can start to ask questions how we can actively work together to understand more of the world or build collectives which are able to make good decisions. To think about higher um, uh, forms of governance, I want to introduce two things you for sure heard about before. So we need self-sovereign digital identities for that. Um, uh, just as a definition here, self-sovereign digital identities will replace any password key uh, you use today while enabling full control over your data uh, and you can access it or other, uh, in a different way said, this is the potential uh, digital self-sovereign digital identities have. Um, they also enable that you get rid of sibling attacks uh, while doing voting. 
So this is very crucial. If we want to do voting in any uh, D app, we need to have a system to ensure that the human is voting, that we have a proof of a human, and that we ensure um, uh, that uh, we don't have uh, 1,000 votes or 10,000 votes from one person. Digital voting um, is another requirement we have, and the funny thing here is we all have that. Every D app which includes voting will need that. So voting anytime, anywhere, close to zero cost um, procedures. So I'm running out of time, so I try to, to get it all in. Um, if you look at that model, uh, I was speaking about layer one governance and layer two governance. If I speak about layer one governance, I mean those things uh, which are on the one side uh, protocol governance, but I also mean uh, the things we all need anyway with each D app. For example, an anonymous verifiable voting infrastructure. We don't need to build that 10,000 times, we just can do that one time, and we can ensure that this is part of the core protocols as well as soft server and digital identities. Because we will use it anyway, again and again and again, and we can ensure that we have a very well-functioned, uh, very uh, resilient system on, at this point, which can be used by, by any AD app. Uh, in the upper model, you see uh, higher functions or higher uh, D governance functions. So this means if you combine uh, governance functions, we, uh, we get them in here uh, and can create governance models. Uh, I want to classify them a little bit, and this is only a proposal. Um, if we speak, uh, I, I want to introduce like three forms, sensor functions, um, which are for reflection, uh, proposal functions, which are for proposing solutions, and signaling or decision functions. Um, if we look at the sensor functions, we have um, uh, uh, the, the situation that we need to have a way to reflect with our environment. So for example, you're driving in a car, um, and uh, you are with multiple people in that car and one person said, oh, okay, I need a break. Okay, so but why is saying that? That's some kind of a sense of function. Or seeing, for example, in the car, oh, I'm running low on fuel. That's some kind of a sense of function. Uh, a survey can be a sense of function to understand the state of the system. Uh, if we go under to a proposal function, we speak about those things uh, which are needed uh, to come up with a solution. So for example, some people say, okay, take the next fuel station or actually in 500 meters there's a parking lot. What do you think? Let's take that one. So these are the proposals, and if you use very sophisticated methods like the Delphi method, you can very good crowdsource expertise here. Petition systems are another system for uh, having a proposal function to ensure that you can come up with a solution for a given problem. Um, part of that is also the signaling or the uh, signal function or decision functions. And we have a lot of them, and we know a lot of them. Uh, for example, if we want to vote on a proposal um, in old Rome with the gladiators, we had the situation that the leader was standing there looking at the crowd, was waiting for the signal functions, how they want to have the decision if the gladiator lives or dies. After getting that, uh, he had also the proposal already <laughs> to decide what he wanted. But you can do that way more sophisticated. So we have voting function, contraset voting, median voting, uh, modified approval voting uh, or other uh, more complex systems like liquid democracy. Uh, I want to uh, get a slide in from a professor. I will uh, uh, show the source on the next slide. If it really depends which decision we want to make, which decision function we need. So it's very, very context um, based um, for that. So we know already and we have mathematical proof that specific things are very easy to decide with specific functions and others very hard. Make a yes or no statement to do you want to have a green, blue or yellow car? You can't. But if I ask you do you want to have a yellow or a green car, it's easy. So this is, this is really, really very important to understand. Based on the complexity of the decision we want to make, we need to take the right decision function. Um, I think you might know that example. There was a, a testing uh, how much a cow weighs uh, from a group of experts. And they were pretty uh, good with uh, guessing that. So the crowd intelligence worked here. Uh, I would bet that this works also for the Mount Everest if we ask all of you. This only works if we are related to the thing we are uh, making a decision on. Um, and this only works if we really want to find, for example, the average value. If we want to find something else, we need to take a different decision function. Uh, this guy, Pietro uh, Speroni.it, uh, he's a leading uh, expert in that field. He has done a lot of mathematical proofs there. Uh, proofs there. 
Um, and I can only highly, uh, um, yeah, just, just visit his website. It's very impressive. Um, just as a short question, because I started later, do I have another five minutes? Okay, so I will, I'm, I'm nearly through. I'm nearly through, just to, okay. So this is a model uh, which uh, tries to generalize uh, the way how we can build uh, governance systems um, based on what we already introduced. So we have uh, the government layer one, which is the uh, core layers uh, where decisions are made um, about um, all the core protocols we all need. And then we have uh, DApp and content governance which is based on the core levels, uh, layers, which will live in the shards or in the namespaces. So just think about it that we have all that smaller blockchains, which speak with the main blockchains, uh, but where we can have separate um, uh, functions, for example, which uh, consensus we want to reach, but we also can introduce other governance functions there. So if you think, for example, about Aragon, Aragon is a, is a model uh, which provides uh, policy, uh, uh, policies, and every D app, uh, is a child of that smart contract policies. And this is what you see here represented. So I believe that we will have many shards and many namespaces which have their uh, values and uh, which provide their policies. And for example, namespace B could be a government, uh, government uh, namespace where you have government compliance, while namespace C is an open namespace where you don't have government compliance. The point is when you spawn instances on those different shards uh, of a D app, the interesting thing becomes that you can interconnect them, but you can decide which instance you want to connect to, the, uh, to all the other instances or which one you want to uh, let out. For example, if we have a namespace B, the situation that illegal content is provided by a social media um, uh, D app, um, uh, the D app provider might have a governance function to uh, block that, but the D app itself will run in that namespace further, but will not influence the other namespaces. So we can have a multi-layer um, approach here to enable uh, regulation uh, for governance on the one side, but we have free uh, shards on the other side. Feel free to uh, come to me to discuss this further. This is just one of the first drafts and uh, we are very happy to, to develop this further. Um, just as a, a call for action, uh, governance functions in general are highly complex and we have probably thousands of them. So it's about time that we start to search them, classify them uh, and generalize them. So we don't need to come up with them over and over and over again. And we need to understand what governance function fits the best in which situation. And based on that, we can accelerate uh, something we need for every D app, decentralized governance. As a short announcement, there uh, is a conference planned in Athens for uh, giving that a room uh, to discuss those things further. Um, at the moment, uh, we have some pending um, conversations uh, to get it kickstarted. If you have ideas about giving this topic the room it deserves, uh, please reach out uh, and feel free to support that. Okay, it's time for questions. Thank you.